Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jenny Lawson, President and CEO of Keep America Beautiful. Thank you for joining us today for the next chapter in Litter Hurts, All Creatures Great and Small. Today, we're going to talk about creatures in the land and air and the effect that litter uh, has on, um, on them and on us. And uh, I could not be more pleased to bring this, uh, to bring Aaron and Blaine and Steve to the table today. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce your host, um, Keep America Beautiful's uh, Director of Foundations and Grants, but also uh, a conservationist and executive director of a uh, New Jersey environmental organization and the author of, and I want to get the title right for you here, Data, David, the, the author of Wild New Jersey, Nature Adventures in the Garden State. David earned his MBA in marketing from New York University Stern School of Business, and we are delighted for him to uh, lead this conversation today. So with that, I uh, thank you all for being here, and I will turn it over to David Wheeler. David, over to you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be with you all today and uh, to talk about uh, another side of litter. You know, we we uh, often see firsthand that Keep America Beautiful and our hundreds of affiliates and, and partners all around the country, just how much litter impacts people and, and our society. Uh, but th the flip side of that is that litter has impacts that go well beyond uh, people and, and our day to day lives. Uh, we see that consistently uh, litter impacting wildlife and animals in, in a number of ways uh, across the country and across the world. And uh, I'm especially pleased to introduce our three speakers, our, our uh, guest speakers who can each share very unique perspectives on some of the, the challenges and problems and some of the things that you can do, you watching this, how you can make a difference in either preventing or helping to address some of these issues that are raised over the course of this webinar. Uh, and so with that, I'd love to introduce each of our three speakers. Uh, first, uh, Aaron Garner uh, is an award-winning photographer and artist. Uh, Aaron graduated from Bailey University with a BFA in graphic design and, and completed a production internship with IMAX. She's been with the City of Tyler Parks and Recreation Department since 2018 and has led the Keep Tyler Beautiful program since February 22. Erin uh, is actively involved with protecting pollinators, specifically bees, through the Bee City USA program. Steve Jewett is the founder of National Cleanup Day. He's an entrepreneur and inventor who grew up in Kansas City before moving from the flatlands to Colorado after catching the skiing and mountaineering bugs. Steve has climbed all of the 14,000 foot peaks in Colorado and most of them in California, has summited on Denali, and has climbed over 13,000 feet more than a thousand times. Steve has helped many people in the wilderness through mountain rescue as a mission coordinator in Eagle County, Colorado, and considers the effort to, to keep the world clean as his pay it forward and inspiring others to do the same. Blaine Rothhauser is a wildlife ecologist with GZA Geoenvironmental, and he brings three decades of experience with wetland and aquatic resource assessment, ecological restoration, and mitigation across the US. Blaine developed the ecological tool of terrestrial rapid bioassessment or TRBA, which uses nocturnal moth surveys as proxies for ecological health. A professional wildlife photographer and gifted speaker, Blaine's wildlife photographs and words have graced the pages of magazines, newsletters, exhibits, and books, while his compelling talks include a TED talk on making your lawn more wildlife friendly. And with that, I'm pleased to turn it over uh, to our first speaker, Erin, uh, who will give us a, a short uh, synopsis of some of her ob observations, which we'll be revisiting throughout the webinar. Erin. Thank you so much, David, and thank you all for having me here. Um, I am here to speak on behalf of pollinators. Um, of course, we all know there's a lot of different types of pollinators. Bees are the big one that everybody knows, but there's butterflies, different types of bugs, small mammals, even birds, things like that. Um, but pollinators are a keystone species in our ecosystem. They are what make a lot of things happen and they're very behind the scenes animals. And so I'm gonna be speaking today about kind of the overarching effects that we're seeing and the lack of awareness 
of the issues that are with pollinators because it's easy to you know look at some of wildlife especially when they're cute and cuddly and see oh gosh those terrible things but it's hard to see with um, smaller creatures to really catch those effects and see the long-term issues and even the forward issues. Excellent, thank you so much, Aaron. And uh, I would like to now turn it over to Steve. How you doing today? Um, Steve Jewett, um, the uh, outdoors is a place of uh, great enjoyment and peace for uh, many Americans. Um, we see a lot of complaints uh, that are sent to land managers about uh, litter and trash. In 2013, Clean Trails was created to address uh, these issues in a positive and friendly way to bring individual responsibility to litter less and to clean up more. We expanded our mission to include National Cleanup Day on the third Saturday in September, including all 50 states and US territories. Uh, and that goes from sea to shining sea. The visual impacts of improperly managed waste are obvious and are solvable with a combination of individual action and with companies that improve their products and packaging to meet consumer demand. The effect on animals, though, is often profound. Litter is often perceived as food by animals and, often, and looks and feels and smells like a tasty treat. The impact to, um, of litter to animals extends from before birth and throughout their lives. Um, and we want to examine the direct and indirect consequences to animals uh, and how that impacts uh, the animals uh, to and humans globally. Excellent. Thank you so much, Steve. You're and welcome. I'd like to turn it over now to Blaine. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, I'm an ecologist in a, in a uh, land steward uh, practitioner. It, my whole career has been predicated on um, changing landscapes from very impacted to as uh, bioecologically viable as they can be. And I've done this mainly in my home state of New Jersey, uh, in, of course, David's home state. And by the way, little plug, you got to read his book, man. I'm telling you, this is a book that, that presents uh, the most beautiful biologically diverse state. You ready for this? In the nation. Oh, come on, Mr. Rothhauser. That's impossible. You're talking about New Jersey, not Southern Florida. You're not talking about Hawaii. No, I'm talking about New Jersey. And the reason this is, is because we have five geophysiographic zones that run the gamut of uh, subhabitat types from estuaries to Great Bays to Pine Barren Preserves, et cetera. Why do I uh, say this at the forefront and what I'm going to talk about? Because all that landscape, I've traversed from uh, Coozer Bog in northern New Jersey right down to Cape May uh, Bay area and every interstitial space in between, I've had some type of interface with. And one thing 35 years career as, a, as a, um, an ecologist has taught me is that the human entrails of, of, um, of its waste stream um, has now infiltrated almost every natural area that I can, I can uh, delve myself into. And I'll be citing some of those examples and providing uh, some, some good news too in all of this. Uh, as a psychotic state with 10 million people strong and growing uh, exponentially, you, you have a situation where um, we have to all become better land stewards. And I think that's the ultimate reason why we're here. And hopefully we'll have a nice lively discussion to, to bring it home. Thank you. Thanks, Blaine. And actually, we can we can stay with you. We're going to dive a little deeper into uh, each of the speakers before uh, getting into some some of the common themes we've seen across the country in terms of litter impacts with wildlife. Uh, Blaine, you mentioned some of those uh, some of those changes you've seen over time. Um, what are what are some of the uh, those human impacts on wildlife, on nature, and ecology that that you've noticed and that you know kind of caught your eye over the years? Yeah. So again, it, it, it's New Jersey's a great example to, to discuss this. And again, I could bore people with plastics and just uh, human debris. I know we got images of of that. That's everywhere. The human footprint has uh, has impacts locally, backyards, industrial sites, etc., where you just can't get away from it. So again, in a state. Uh, with uh, over 10 billion, uh, 10 million people, you're going to get that 
um, in the areas where uh, roads, streams, subdivisions exist. But it's amazing uh, the other offshoots of pollution. And again, if we're talking litter and pollution, definitionally, we're talking about um, any aspect of human condition that uh, has a harmful effect, uh, either toxic or poisonous, to the biophysical world. So that's that's not just the plastic in the uh, hard items. That's the that's the PFAS, the the legacy organochemicals that humans produce that find their way insidiously at the base of these food chains that I see personally uh, degrading. Um, wildlife, the songbird behind me, the blue uh, winged warbler in all of its kind, all the warblers are in severe decline. It's not just habitat loss. It's actually what's biomagnifying from uh, human, what I like to call cultural effluvium, you know, just the, uh, it's, it's what's coming off the hard plastic. It's what's coming off the mattresses that you find in the woods. It's what's coming, coming in from uh, various insidious ways. So I'm seeing the, the birds that I used to see in good quantities, especially the neotropical birds like the one behind me, are, are noticeably in decline. I'm still seeing them and I'm seeing them in the appropriate habitats, but they're stretching farther and farther away from the human um, the, the human footprint areas. So you have to, I have to travel farther and deeper to see the same things I saw 30 years ago as an ecologist today. And that's because of the cultural biologic pollution. And that's my intro. <laughs> I could go on and on, but I, I, yep, there you go. Thanks, Blaine. And, and yeah, the images really, really tell a story in themselves. And, and you know, Blaine's encountering these, these impacts, you know, across a, a very densely populated state and, and uh, like New Jersey. Steve, you've been exploring some of the most remote places in the country and on the planet. Um, and, and you're encountering uh, some surprising findings there as well. Can you tell us about some of that? Yeah, so one of the uh, reasons why we started up Clean Trails was because uh, we'd go hiking and in some of these remote areas in the Sierras in Colorado, uh, Washington, I've also climbed in Alaska, uh, Europe, and South America. Uh, we'd see litter and trash just in uh, uh, just very unusual places. Uh, where there's animals that are at the top of these mountains, little pikas and marmots, uh, they'll come over and uh, they'll chew on pieces of plastic if you leave them out. Uh, they would, uh, uh, I had one marmot that came up to me one time and started eating my backpack uh, because it thought it was food. And uh, this was near the top of a mountain. So uh, uh, it's everywhere and uh, it's uh, pernicious. It's, uh, uh, they're making their nests out of it uh, in, 14,000 foot peaks. Um, so uh, there's an image that I have, if it's available, uh, that is of the top of a mountain in uh, San Diego, where uh, it was kind of the impetus for uh, what we started. I have seen a lot of strange things out there as well. Thanks, Steve. And, and you know, you're encountering these, uh, and it's you know, in some ways, it's shocking to hear that there's still these impacts as, as you know, far removed as you can often be from civilization. Um, and yet, we're also seeing some of those impacts in, in some of the species that we depend on most directly, species uh, or groups of species like pollinators that uh, we depend on for food and, and, uh, and you know, are, are essentially, in so many ways, our, our very existence. You know, when, when you think about uh, when we have breakfast each day, almost every food you can trace either directly or indirectly to a pollinator, um, almost regardless of what you're having for breakfast. Aaron, you, uh, you've you worked uh, with pollinator gardens, with beekeeping, uh, and you've seen some uh, some examples as well of, of, uh, of litter and, and related impacts on those pollinators. Yeah, um, thank you again, David. Um, of course, you know, just like Blaine and Steve have talked about, habitat loss is a big issue for pollinators. Again, the chemicals, climate change, disease, all those things that are affecting everybody else. Um, but specifically with pollinators, um, and my focus is really on bees, you see a lot of physical entanglement. Um, you know, you see a lot of bees getting contamination of food sources. 
that litter can contaminate nectar, pollen. They're also getting into food sources that aren't natural. Um, that image right there that's being shown is actually um, some bees that got into an M&M factory and they came back and created blue honey, which was not usable by the beekeepers that were keeping those bees. Um, it's you know distracting by that food waste and then further decreases pollination. There's um, also disruption in those pollinator dynamics. Um, those natural interactions with plants and pollinators, um, it can obstruct access to plants and flowers, um, interfering with that scent and visual cue. Pollinators like bees and butterflies almost rely solely on scent and visual cues. So if there's any kind of obstruction, they're gonna have a hard time getting to that. Um, and I'll kind of talk more later on about the global food security aspect of it and some other things, but pollinators, like you said, are so important to our food sources. If there's not enough food for them, there's not going to be enough food for us. It's a daunting thought and, and uh, you know, one which should, should reverberate, you know, even more uh, with, with people when we look at the, the declines of pollinators. I know, Blaine, you've encountered that in your work as well. Uh, working with a range of pollinators on, on you know, sites across New Jersey and, and across the country. Um, have you had similar observations? Yeah, I'm thinking of the moth study work that we do. Again, unfortunately, it's like the, it's like the songbirds. You're seeing not species disappearing per se. You're seeing the same species every year you go out in your survey. I mean, that's what I do for a living. We go out, we biologically survey. So we have a, a good feel for um, the trajectory. And unfortunately, it's a downward trajectory. You're seeing the same species. We're seeing the same moth species. We're just not seeing them in the same um, quantities. We're not, we're not getting, uh, and a good example of that is a, uh, are the underwing moss. This is a very beautiful guild suite of moss that uh, basically in June through the end of August, you get a, a good cross section of, of species. And they all have niches that magnetize to one or two or maybe three different types of plants. So you know that What's happening to the plants um, is is running into their metabolisms and causing their um, their declining effects, and that's again the the human element that we don't think of as pollution or litter, but it's there. It's the chemicals that we're using that are finding their way at the base of these chains and um, in causing uh, quantitative declines that that we're just beginning to to understand. Uh, again, when you get this legacy type uh, chemical like PFAS, um, the, these polyfluoroalkalis, they, they are just so available to every organism on planet Earth. Even if you're in Antarctica, you're finding them in, in, um, in penguins and in, in, uh, sea, seabirds. You're getting detectable amounts of these chemicals. And again, we don't even, that's the problem with us, right? We invent such incredible, um, you know, rays of, of usable human-based chemicals that makes our lives so great without thinking it through without saying, well, what's the cradle to grave effect? And um, why does it why does it matter? So uh, it matters because, you know, the the bird behind me and the bees that Aaron talks about and the marmots, the marmots that, uh, that that we're indicating here, they're all the engine pieces to the to the planet's um, ability to clean the air and clean the water. And that's a simple, you know, lesson of ecology 101, right? You need you need all those pieces to function at their maximum in order to um, have a truly litter-free, pollution-free environment. So I'm concerned about the, the legacy chemicals that are um, in the most populated dense areas of, of our country. Thank you, Blaine, and, and Aaron as well. And, and just a, a quick follow-up, you know, when we look specifically at pollinators, um, you know, the fact that roughly one out of every three bites of food we eat, I know, Aaron, you mentioned uh, that the, the global food security uh, is very, you know, very much at stake with with some of these challenges. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, of course. So um, 75% of crops worldwide are pollinator dependent. Um, we actually got this great opportunity for pollinator week, um, the images that are being shown to um, with a local Brookshire's um, to put up signage in the grocery store in front of every single item in the store that had at least one pollinator dependent ingredient. I was there for about eight hours hanging up those signs because um, there are a lot and we had a lot of really great feedback from that. A lot of people didn't realize certain things were pollinator dependent. And specifically, it's a, fa um, a fact that I love throwing out. Pollinators are responsible for $15 billion in crops nationwide. I mean, that's if, if that were to collapse, I mean, it'd be catastrophic for the ag agriculture industry. They maintain that biodiversity. They help support that um, healthy ecosystem and also, you know, that providing that habitat for food and other things. But like I said, uh, the food security part is the part that very much concerns me. And when you really look at it, it's not just fruits and vegetables and nuts. It's even the meat and dairy industry. Cows and um, other livestock are reliant on alfalfa and clover in their food sources and bees and other pollinators help create that. I don't know about you, but I don't wanna pay $60 for a hamburger you know, here in the next few years. And we have to make sure that those food sources are available or you're gonna continue to see that inflation on food and groceries. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, absolutely uh, fascinating to hear. And, and I think a lot of people don't associate meat as an example that, you know, that being pollinator dependent, but it absolutely is. Um, Blaine, you mentioned uh, some of the migratory, neotropical migratory songbirds. Um, you know, we, we've seen uh, a wide range of successes with birds over the years uh, that human activity, you know, put them into, into trouble and, and at the risk of extinction. And then in a different way, human activity helped them to, to return everything from those egrets and herons uh, relentlessly hunted for their feathers uh, for for fashion back in the early 1900s to, uh, of course, the scourge of DDT, which nearly wiped out bald eagles and ospreys and peregrine falcons and brown pelicans, uh, as well as many other wildlife species. They came back, uh, they were able to make remarkable comebacks thanks to the scientist Rachel Carson and her uh, work, The Silent Spring. Um, along those lines, oh, and there's uh, somebody uh, holding a juvenile bald eagle. I, I got the <laughs> chance to do that years ago. And and again, that's all part of that that work by people to kind of reverse some of the impacts that, that people have made previously uh, to nature and wildlife. Uh, with birds in, in currently now, you know, we, we know birds have many bird species have declined over the last few decades in particular. Uh, what are all three of you uh, seeing now in terms of uh, your own work? Uh, are you seeing, you know, new impacts? Are you seeing, especially as it might relate to to litter and, and, and human caused impacts? Well, I'll take a stab at that first. The, the uh, certainly along the coast. And again, these, uh, the, these types of inputs st start from terrestrial systems inland and you know our trash and litter find their way from dry areas to to wet areas to wetter areas to streams to rivers then downstream uh we have that good picture of the troy brook with all that plastic and then of course all of that feeds itself into bigger rivers and then to the ocean so i've been doing some um some whale watching tours. I've been guiding some. And I, when I'm looking at the, especially the seagulls who are scavengers, okay, um, and herons, uh, you're seeing this type of, of, of impact like on a regular basis. I took that in Sandy Hook a few months ago. This isn't like an, a vintage image. This is a recent image. That's a little piece of plastic fencing of some kind. It's probably foraging on the be beach. And I think it's just stuck around his neck. I, I hope it's not impaled. I don't think it was, but I mean, you're seeing more and more of this in, in uh, seagulls missing legs and heron missing legs due to fishing line. Um, but even, Worse than that is the uh, is the ingestion of these hard materials from especially plastic bags and 
uh, in bottle caps and plastic. This is you're, the people who I've talked to, the, the wildlife um, forensic. I, I had a conversation last week in preparation as so what's the what's the main ingredient in the guts of of raccoons, seagulls, birds, whatever. And then they're like microplastics and plastics where we're getting them in the skin tissues. And we're getting them in the guts that they, you know, not digest. And sometimes it impairs them to the back to the to the um, degree that they can't they can no longer eat. And now this was recently, and I'll end with this. If anybody wants to put an exclamation point at the end of this sentence, watch Planet Earth 2 with David Attenborough, where he um, shows a Pacific, mid-Pacific island above Hawaii, L Laysan Island, where the Laysan albatross breeds. It's just this barren island. It's covered with human effluvium, mainly plastic and bags, it's because it's in this gyre. It's this this vortex that that takes all the the the, the ocean's uh, plastics and and vortex it right onto this island. And you know this is an endangered bird that ninety percent of them have plastics in their gut. Their mortality rate is over half. It's it's extremely vulnerable to extinction. So are the other albatross that are on this island. But anyway, the point being is, if you want to, if you want to understand um, how the weight of 8.2 billion people uh, impact nature directly, just just the obvious litter pollution aspect of it, take a gander at, at that um, documentary. It's very well done and really puts a, an exclamation point on this. Thanks, Blaine. And, and Steve, I, I know you had also, uh, I believe, worked with uh, seabirds as well. Right. So uh, I did want to uh, go a little bit more on what Blaine said just a moment ago about the Lake San Albatross. Uh, the bottle caps that uh, they uh, eat, uh, they bring in and they give to their babies. So one of the reasons why they're endangered is specific pieces of plastic. It's uh, pretty um, uh, scary on how that is affecting one bird uh, in particular. Uh, that's uh, endangered. There's other birds as well. There's a recent study where I talked to the uh, researcher that uh, came up with this concept called plasticosis. And plasticosis is uh, uh, found in uh, specific seabirds uh, and is caused by ingesting small pieces of plastic and microplastics. Uh, the small pieces of plastic, not on the large scale, but on the small scale, uh, they go into the gut, uh, they go past the uh, barrier uh, into the blood, and they can cause uh, scarring, fibrotic scarring uh, throughout the entire animal. And it's uh, specific to plastic. It's not caused by anything else. Uh, the researcher explained that they think that some of this is happening in other animals. Uh, at this point, there's uh, no specifics that say this is happening in humans, but it's almost certain that uh, there's uh, some effect on that. So cellular level too. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, and it's amazing how universal, you know, we're finding that around the country, around the world rather. Um, you know, and, and the other thing is while while birds are either consuming or getting caught as in the, in the case of that plastic fencing, uh, you know, consuming plastics and other harmful materials, it, it's keeping them from eating. It's, it could be keeping them from breeding within the case of pollinators. If they're consuming these these other you know uh, candies like in the uh, M&M factory, that, that means they're not pollinating at, at, that, at that time. They're not putting their energy towards what they need uh, to survive both individually and, and as a species. So a, a lot of challenges that way. Uh, but, but even beyond birds too, uh, bats, uh, another group of uh, f flying uh, species that that are vital just like pollinators vital in so many ways to humans you know uh bats uh, although many of uh, many people are uh you know skittish around bats or, or fearful based on the old myths uh in reality bats uh, are huge uh, uh friends to humans uh, a single bat can eat over 3000 mosquito sized insects flying insects in a single night add that up uh, about the impact of all those bats in terms of pest control uh, you know, they they also disperse seeds, they assist with pollination, and, and that pest control even helps water quality, you know, because there's less pesticide 
uh, needed in certain areas that have really healthy bat populations. Uh, unfortunately, those uh, healthy populations are becoming fewer and farther in between ever since uh, 2006 when a, uh, a fungus called white nose syndrome arrived on what, what is believed to be a, a, on the boots of cave explorers who came over from Europe uh, bringing this fungus to the U.S., uh, arrived in a cave near Albany. And uh, from there, it's now spread across the country and impacted many bat species and in some cases you know, seeing 99% die-offs of certain bat populations. So huge impacts uh, caused by humans to, the, to these uh, species. Um, this is sort of, sort of an invasive species, uh, you know, example, but, but also sort of like a living litter example. Um, would any of you like to talk about the impacts to bats? Um, I could definitely jump in here. You know, um, here in Texas, we have some of the largest bat colonies in the United States. Um, they are a huge part of our ecosystem here. And um, we're seeing a lot of human waste on the side of food waste getting out, especially things like open trash cans, things like that, that they're getting into in the evenings. And they are eating that rather than eating, like you said, mosquitoes, rather than eating um, pollinating, doing all that. So you're seeing a reduction in pollination rates. You're seeing a rise in pests like mosquitoes um, just because these trash cans are left open rather than sealed. Or yeah, you may have it in a trash bag. And I'm sure that um, Blaine or Steve are gonna hit on you know other wildlife getting in there like bears and things like that. Just because you put it near a trash can or on top of a trash can does not mean that it is secured. They're getting into those things and it is disrupting their diet, leading to poor nutrition, which then is coming back and creating other hazardous effects. Yeah, again, I'm thinking you just popped something in my mind that I wasn't prepared to, to say, but it, it those Mexican free tail bats are in the same types of habitats as ocelots, the, the, um, the civil type cat, very native to the Americas and in Central America and Mexico that are forced because of human garbage to, to feed and forage, forage closer to roads. So another documentary on, on that species where they were getting hit by cars prematurely because they're out closer to the roads trying to um, you know get a free free lunch or feed on the rodents that are attracted to to the garbage yeah yeah we're just taking planet earth in like a snow a christmas snowball just mixing everything up and just letting the flakes fall where they may and hoping that it's going to correct itself well it does it just goes negatively uh down the spirals w wanting to start over again you are creating a situation where um you're you're going to de-evolve and let things sort themselves out over geologic time that's the thing that we don't understand stand as humans right we live in a in a 75 year average lifespan we're not we're not living under geologic uh you, you know constructs uh, where we're seeing uh, in a nanosecond of geologic time the human footprint change the scope of everything everything is is changed and it, it doesn't take a special person to just open his eyes and see the manifestation of, of all those changes around them in the form of litter and pollution. And um, in, a, in the bat issue with white nose, that's a fungus that was brought in, as Dave said, by spelunkers. That's a form of pollution. Why are we playing games inside the constructs of, of ecology um, to the detriment of all life on earth. Why do we do this and, and then pretend that we're the smartest, most sentient being uh, walking planet earth? You can't have, you can't have both. We got to start through these types of conversations to just take a big step back and simplify the way we go about our daily life. We can't, we can no longer look at the planet as though it's an endless um, GDP uh, race to the top. We got to we got to get the mentality in our brains that we got to simplify. We don't have to be chasing, um, you know, the grandiose 
two, three percent of, of annual growth that the major countries in the world do. Because if we do, if we continue down that road, it's just going to no matter how many bags we recycle, no matter how, how many laws we pass, we are still going to leave in our wake the human entrails of cultural effluvium. Boy, that was like a closing statement. OK, uh, I like, well, we're not. <laughs> We're not there yet, but uh, <laughs> I'll but, defer. But, that was my closing statement. I'll let everybody else finish up with. Sorry, I, I, Steve, did, have, if you were gonna... I did have one comment on that too. Uh, and this goes to the cleanup side of the world. Uh, I've had a um, uh, beach that I uh, clean up on a regular basis in San Diego, and it's always been pretty clean. And I actually was uh, going down beyond where most of the people do cleanups and uh, was off a little bit onto the side. And I was amazed at the amount of trash and litter that I found there because uh, there weren't as many people uh, that uh, were in the area doing those cleanups. Uh, and then after I got out of that area, there was a uh, large dumpster uh, that was about uh, 10 feet away from a bunch of trash cans that all the trash cans were sitting overflowing and the dumpster was sitting there nearly empty. So as uh, we mentioned earlier, all that trash and litter, if it's uh, put into a, um, a trash can, but it's overflowing, doesn't do any good. So that area was just downstream, uh, so to speak, of the flow of the uh, ocean current uh, from where that was. It was indicative of people need to take a place and really make sure that place is theirs. That's a great point, Steve. And actually, I, I do want to come back to that. Uh, a little bit later um, about, you know, I definitely want to spend some time talking about what what we can do. What what do you do when you encounter that? You're out in nature, you encounter a, a an overflowing garbage can. So what, what's your, your best bet at that point? I want to come back to that. A, a quick note, um, uh, it was meant, Blaine had mentioned about wildlife coming closer to the roads, feeding on the litter, that kind of thing. Love to talk a little bit about uh, some of the terrestrial wildlife who who in increasingly is is counting on uh, or getting trapped and in, in trapped in, in some of our litter. Um, if you think about, you know, uh, uh, Yellowstone National Park, the the kind of the the founding jewel of the U.S. and thus the world's park system, the first national park uh, of prominence. Uh, Yellowstone, up till a few decades ago, was still feeding bears. Um, in, in uh, kind of almost like a stadium atmosphere, inviting guests to watch the bear feeding. Um, so understand our understanding changes quickly. Unfortunately, the impacts haven't fully been lost. Uh, here, uh, maybe many of you might have seen this, this horrible uh, image of a bear got, that got its head stuck in a, a bucket. I've seen similar images with deer uh, that, that basically get their head caught in something and then are literally walking around with it. Um, impeding their their movements. Um, what are some of the other uh, impacts or, or some of the you know firsthand encounters you all have had with uh, with terrestrial wildlife and and some of uh, and and some of those impacts on their lives? Well, I I certainly said you know traversing New Jersey like I have the last thirty five years I've seen box turtles in in tomato uh, soup cans, but you talk about perseverance i i watched i didn't interfere for the first 10 minutes of that because the the turtle was like trying to catch it on something to pull itself out and it caught a little root and it got out by itself i'm like yeah hooray man i was high high clawing it and um then there was a, a case with a milk snake a neighbor of mine called me over you know he had he had his shrubs netted for deer i mean again think about think about that scenario right here the guy is protecting his non-native arborvitae with deer netting thinking he's doing something for nature oh i planted i planted non-native crap around my house and then he's got this this uh, uh, uh deer netting that the milk snake, the only native animal he's he's got on his property, gets caught in it. Anyway, I got him untangled, but that happens all the time. People are putting. I have a fence um, scenario with a great blue heron at at a uh, preserve that I help manage, and um, the the owner, the owner, the the, the sword uh, gave me a, a great blue heron skull. 
I go, oh my God, that is so cool. I add it to my skull collection, right? I'm a, I'm a morbid type of skull collector so of wildlife. So I got this beautiful, unbelievable, great blue heron. And where'd you get it? He goes, ah, oh, you don't want to know. I go, uh, okay, go ahead. And he, it was from a, um, an, a discarded fence that was, that was still put upright on inside the preserve leaning against a tree. I guess the heron got, you know, got stuck in between and he literally died in place, right? And was just hanging on the on the fence. So again, a human construct. Uh, and finally, I'll give you the, the worst one of them all. Uh, I'm a big fan of Carolina Wrens. The person that I work with, Nicolette, knows I love Carolina Wrens. So this Carolina Wren um, that I found dead inside a mammal trap, okay, of my own making. I was setting mammal traps up uh, to do surveys for mammals, and a Carolina wren had had gotten in there and passed before I had a chance to to check it. So everywhere we go, we're just juggernauts. We're we're dis we're destructible forces that can't be avoided. And um, the only way out of this is to simplify. Okay, I'm done. I like, I like that simplification idea. I'll give you one quick example as well. I actually saw a bird choking on uh, plastic and it got stuck in its throat. I uh, didn't know of anything that I could do um, and tried to figure out a way to, you know, do something. And uh, the bird was able to fly away, but uh, that was almost certainly a fatal event for that bird. Uh, I know that that happens all the time. I've seen personally many birds, uh, you know, picking at the uh, trash and the waste that's uh, mismanaged, uh, you know, on beaches, on trailheads, um, pretty much everywhere. And, and actually, that's a, a great point, Steve. I'd love to talk about uh, when we talk about invasive species, as, as we start to talk in the, in the remainder of this session about how people can make a difference, how individuals and, and affiliates and, and community groups can make a difference. Uh, let's start with the, on the invasive species front. Um, as a number of you have mentioned, you know, planting native, which is something we we emphasize our our program retreat uh, uses only native trees that are specific to the region um, and 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 the habitat and the, and the climate. Uh, working with local arborists to make sure they're the best possible fit. Um, unfortunately, many people uh, still use uh, use exotic uh, plants and, and trees not not native to those regions. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, some recommendations from, from any of the speakers as to how uh, people and, and, and or communities can start to shift away from those invasive or exotic species towards uh, utilizing more native plants. I can uh, jump in here, David. Um, one of the biggest things I like to say, and it's a bit controversial, but I think that the American suburban lawn is one of the worst things that could happen to our ecosystem and biodiversity. You know, it's beautiful shortcut grass and it's green when it's green. I don't know, here in this Texas heat, it's pretty much all brown. But um, we have got to get away from wanting that look as a society. You know, I've seen beautiful, beautiful images of pollinator gardens here in Tyler. We have the Texas Municipal Rose Garden where we have 14 acres of roses. We um, also have, um, this image is of our native pollinator garden and Monarch Way Station that's in the idea side of our garden. And to me, that's beautiful. You know, the, the biodiversity that's there, you're getting lots of different types of pollinators that are through there not only feeding, but within the soil, you're getting all the animals that are living there are getting better nutrition. You're saving money because a lot of them are much more drought resistant, especially here in the South, um, because they are made for that area. Also, you're getting uh, savings on your personal labor, those um, invasive species, those exotic species are a lot more expensive to maintain and they are not contributing to what's going on in that biodome, um, in the biome. So it's, it's much more helpful to plant what is happy there because everybody in that area, whether they are insects, animals, anything like that, that is what they are used to. 
So if there's any one piece of advice I could give, it's get rid of your lawn, plant clover, plant native species. You're gonna start seeing a lot more diversity there and the animals that live in the area are gonna be a lot happier. Yeah, I Thanks. couldn't agree I couldn't agree with that anymore. I mean, I couldn't even it's hard to even add add to what Aaron just said. Uh, but it, it's happening. If somebody wants some good news, um, me and my cohort who's working with me right now, Nicolette, we're at a corporate Fortune 500 company as I speak. We're doing biodiversity surveys because we're giving them opportunities to uh, restore their their footprint. Matter of fact, this company wants to um, take their footprint, which is all concrete, mortar, and asphalt, and uh, see what was there, see what's here now, and then say, I want to double my diversity in 10 years. This is what this company's doing. I guess I can mention a company. It's just I'm bragging about them. It's L'Oreal, the, the makeup company. And um, so I've traveled all over the country doing these uh, biodiversity surveys. And they want to change this. They want to make sure that they recycle everything and get uh, have no waste on their grounds. They don't, they don't want plastic. They don't want anything in their grounds. So that there is this mentality in the corporate world. There's this mentality in the civic world, too. In New Jersey, they just passed a no plastic law that was in effect since last May. Uh, so every, everybody goes to the, the stores, have to bring those bags. There's no more plastic. Um, that has to have a serious impact on And it's an, it's an outreach and education. Even if the bags themselves aren't making much of a difference, which they are, it's the it's what Aaron is doing at the store, putting up that sign. I'm going to do that, Aaron. That's a, I have to. That's a great thing to do, to just get the the little spark in people's mind that you're just such a waste. We're just such a wasteful, bipedal, knuckle dragging bunch of bunch of uh, apes that we're not we're not really advancing if we don't change just the way we treat our ecosystem. So, yeah, I see some some. Um, some lights at the end of a, of a pretty dark tunnel. Right. There's one other do that uh, people should consider if they're out hiking and they go from one area to another, uh, this would be involving invasive species. And that's where uh, you make sure your shoes or your equipment is clean. Uh, because uh, again, in the cave uh, example that we talked about earlier, that's something that's easily transmittable. And uh, there are seeds that get uh, moved around uh, the country just through people's uh, equipment. Um, the quagga mussels are obviously a, a big issue on the waterways as well as an invasive species. Rock snot, right? Right, yep. Steve. That's what they that's what they call it. They it's an algae that gets on the stream river bottoms. That's an invasive species. There's nothing. There's no place on planet Earth, incl including Antarctica, where the human footprint, that's why we live in the Anthropocene. That's exactly why geologists call it the Anthropocene. It's the first time one species is responsible for the, the downsizing of, of all other species on, on the Earth. And that's, um, that's a pretty disgusting word, the Anthropocene, but it is a new geologic um, epoch. Um, that that uh, that we that we talk about, and and just to further that, um, Steve, which is that's a great example, the the rock snot, um, but the, there is um, you know there's biologic uh, chemical pollution in every ecosystem now, and I'm not just talking about these legacy things. I'm talking about the 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 way we um, it, it fertilize uh, over fertilize ponds, rivers, streams that cause the pollution that's known as um, uh, anoxic conditions in ponds that that then manifest with no dragonflies, no no birds that eat the dragonflies in these systems. I mean, it, the, the problem with being an ecologist and the problem with all of us, because we're I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, is that we know too much about what's going on. And it's depressing. It's hard to get up and, and, and go to work and have at this. Um, we have no other choice. We do it. Uh, but it is it doesn't take much if your eyes are open to see. It's like the 
it's the disaster de jour, right, Dave? We've talked about this personally in the past. It's like you get up in the morning. It's like some ecologist or some environmental scientist calls you and says, hey, did you hear about the Asiatic clam? It's no longer in Atlanta County, New Jersey. It's all the way. It's found all the way up in, in, um, in Maine. You know, it's just it's just one bad piece of news after the other. Uh, but there is that light at the end of the tunnel. We are making the types of chain. We got people like Steve and Aaron and Dave in the organization that are that are getting the word out. So hopefully right. this sticks. I think okay. aware such a big part of this uh, as scientists go along, they're going to come up with increasingly bad numbers and information. But ultimately, this is a problem that can be solved by people. We created this one and uh, we can solve it. Uh, but I will give you one more that you probably haven't heard yet. And that's the phyto. I can't wait. Yeah, th this one's a good one. The phytoplankton that are down in the Antarctic, especially, uh, some of them um, bind to plastics better than others. And the ones that bind to plastics better than others produce all, most of the oxygen that the planet produces. And the ones that don't bind to plastic uh, don't do as much. So there's when they bind to plastic, they actually create less oxygen. So we may have less oxygen on the planet uh, as time goes on. I don't think this is an urgent crisis, but uh, it's just crazy that basically every piece of phytoplankton that's ever been measured in the last five or so years has plastics and uh, nanoplastics to microplastics. And, and if I could here, just because I know we're running short on time, I do want to I do want to bring it a little more positive because we've already yeah. talked about a number of uh, really uh, great steps people can take everything from helping pollinators out to uh, you know making their lawn more diverse instead of just the, this grassy expanse um, things like uh, educating others about the importance of some of these issues sealing waste containers etc one one uh, question or point you made earlier um, Steve that I want to come back to um, I, you know, I, I think everybody on this call knows to to dispose of of litter uh, in the proper receptacles, dispose of recycling where where or, or you know recycle where where appropriate. Uh, but but say you, you, as you mentioned, you, you're out on a hike and you do come across to uh, come across to uh, a, a, a piece of litter, but the garbage can is overflowing. Um, you know, what do you do in that case? Uh, what do you recommend doing? So what I generally recommend is that you just go ahead and pick it up. Most people have a uh, backpack or someplace to put it. When we started Clean Trails, the concept was pretty simple, that we had uh, small pieces of equipment uh, that we'd be able to carry with us uh, so that we could pick it up without actually touching it and without needing gloves and stuff. Uh, but a lot of the litter that's out there, if it's small and uh, you know not too obviously like uh, dog poo or uh, Kleenex, uh, people can uh, clean up and be uh, still safe about it. And uh, if you prepare just a little bit, doesn't take a lot, uh, you can um, uh, just take care of that area with uh, very little additional time. And if you concentrate on one area as well, it can help as well. It's like on a trail. Uh, if you uh, start a hiking, uh, a hike on a trailhead, just clean up that little trailhead area uh, as much as possible. Usually if you're with a group, there's somebody that's a lagger, they're five minutes late, 10 minutes late, go ahead and do a cleanup. And it's simple and easy and you'll have your vehicle right there. You can take the trash and put it into the proper receptacle or if you, you have it in your vehicle, you can uh, take it on from there. That's, that's a great point, Steve. And, and actually, I, I love the, the, the takeaway of, of concentrating on a specific area. Um, and just to give one last example of that, and then I wanna turn it back over to Jenny Lawson, our CEO. Um, Debbie Miller in Akron, Ohio, uh, and she also works with our affiliate there, Keep Akron Beautiful. Debbie uh, took it upon herself. She was walking her dog uh, last year, and the dog stepped on a piece of glass and, and, and hurt itself. And from there, Debbie was inspired to start picking up litter in the community. Uh, she picked up up to 50,000 pieces, then continued picking up litter up to 100,000 pieces. Uh, this week, she picked up her 152nd thousand. 152,000th piece of litter. Uh, and 152 for Keep America Beautiful on our network is a, a big number. 152 pieces of litter is what it averages out to each American. That's how for each American, there's 152 pieces of litter in the environment. 
And so we recommend picking up that amount. If if each person can pick up that amount, we're we're addressing the, the problem directly. Uh, Debbie took that to an even further and continues to take that to an even uh, further extent. And so we, I just want to make sure I give that shout out to the incredible and inspiring work that she's doing uh, that really does lead the way uh, and, and complements all the different great tips that our speakers today have uh, have recommended. And with that, uh, Jenny, uh, passing it back over to you. David, thanks. And, and what a point of inspiration and a great reminder that 152 is doable. That's a number that each of us could take some responsibility for and really uh, get out there and uh, and help uh, not only the aesthetics of our community, but as we learn today, the ecosystems that um, that help the planet survive, that are essential to our survival, and that of the uh, land and water animals that that share the earth with us. Uh, so I, I learned so much today. Um, I, I had not really focused on the fact that, um, that if pollinators are eating sugar and trash, that they're not pollinating, they're not doing the job they're there to do, um, and, and, um, and how important that is. And, and really, all of the animals affected by the litter in the ecosystem aren't doing the job they're, they're there to do um, as part of our, the natural cycle of, of Earth and of our of our land and air ecosystems if they're tangled up in our litter and if they are not the healthy animals they need to be. Uh, and so thank you, each of you. Uh, it was just a great, lots of lessons learned. So Blaine and Steve and Aaron, um, it, was a, it was a tough conversation. What's hopeful is that there were 245, 250 people who learned something today and are different because of the conversation that we had. So thank you for taking this time to educate 250 people. We're going to share it and hope that there are 250,000 people that uh, work with us and work with you to clean up America, uh, to take care of our ecosystems and to keep America beautiful. So keep doing beautiful things, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate your time today.